for today. How can a linked CRM bow tie approach prevent fatalities and serious injuries? My name is Jerome Carslake, and I'm the person who manages the RSVP and its many activities. And sitting in the studio, I also have Rosemary joining us. Anthony, would you mind going to the next slide, please? And um, we have an extremely valuable insight today and uh, I'm really looking forward to diving into this one. So for those of you who don't know much about the NRSUP, please feel free to dive on into our website. Um, today we have joining us is Anthony Deacon. Welcome to you, Anthony. Yeah, thanks, good to be here, Jerome. So for those of you who don't know, Anthony has over 20 years experience in HSC, primarily focused towards safety risk management within the mining industry. He joined Rio Tinto in 2007 and has since been responsible for several group-wide programs across all aspects of safety, risk, HSE management systems and assurance. He is presently the Chief Advisor for Critical Risk Management, which is a cornerstone program for Rio, Pinto, Rio Tinto's approach to fatality elimination. And really that's what today's topic is all about. So Anthony was willing to give, is willing to share Rio Tinto's journey with CRM and he's really going to explore how he has built this program along with Rio Tinto on the way. So over to you, Anthony. But first of all, before we dive in, um, we have 60 minutes for today's webinar, 45 minutes for the um, presentation and 15 minutes question time. Um, if you just go to the next slide. What we have here, this is our question function. Please take the time to add in as many questions as you want and we'll make this as interactive as we move through the presentation. We are recording it today and it will be available after the webinar along with the PowerPoint slides on the NRSP website. So let's get on in. Over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Jerome. Uh, so yeah, welcome, welcome everyone. So um, as Jerome said, I'm very happy to uh, present today and share Rio Tinto's journey. Um, around safety and specifically around our critical risk management uh, pr program. Um, I, I guess in doing so, you know, whilst the, the, the topic links back to vehicles and driving, I will be talking more broadly about, about uh, Rio Tinto, uh, our safety strategy and our, our critical risk management program or CRM program as it's called and how it applies to you know, all the risks across the uh, all the fatality risks across the Rio portfolio and then link it back specifically to uh, vehicles and driving. Um, I know there's a number of people on the call today who are quite the experts in the area around vehicles and driving but you know I'll, I'll share some of our insights um, that you know can help you um, build, build your, expand out your experience and, and hopefully connect um, back something that, that I've had to share. So I'll talk about um, our, our journey. I'll talk about uh, the safety loop as it's been coined uh, through the case study to which my presentation uh, supports. I'll talk about, as I said, its application to vehicles and driving. And I'll close by talking about some um, of the program learnings. And hopefully, or guaranteed, I'll leave some time for some questions at the end. Um, so look, a little bit about Rio Tinto. Uh, I think most people on the call um, are or should be familiar with Rio Tinto as a you know major mining uh, company um, globally. You know we employ close to 50,000 people, and we have um, similar amounts of contractors. So I guess that uh, fluctuate to support our operations. Uh, we operate in uh, 35 countries across six continents. So we're a, we are a truly uh, global organisation. You can see some other key points there in terms of how we would describe uh, Rio Tinto as a company. But I also wanted to emphasise that, you know, whilst we are a mining and mineral processing um, com company, we're also a massive uh, transportation and logistics uh, organisation. Um, some sort of simple facts around that is that, you know, Rio Tinto owns and the world's privately owned uh, railways. We, we, we run a, a fleet of ships as well as chartered ships. We, we do over a million flight uh, sectors per year through business and chartered travel. Um, we have a fleet of over a thousand haul trucks and many, many, many more ancillary equipment 
And then we get into light vehicles where, according to the statistics I'm handed, we're doing well in excess of a million vehicle kilometres a, a, a week um, just in one of our major businesses alone, which uh, you know is 30 times uh, around the earth. So I, when I heard that statistics, I thought that was uh, quite, quite eye-opening. So Rio Tinto needs to manage um, those risks across that transport fleet um, and understand the critical controls that, that keep our workers uh, safe. So, like I said, we, we operate uh, globally. Uh, one of the key points around Rio is that uh, we apply the same safety standards across all of our operations, um, no matter what type of operation, from a very, very small operation um, to very large operations, from operations in um, Australia and North America through to our operations in, in Africa. So we apply a very consistent level of safety standard, which is going to be one of the key points that uh, will, will come out through the um, uh, presentation. It is a great challenge for the organisation, but uh, one that is, sort of, is a you know, priority one, is to establish that same level of safety um, um, outcomes acro across the group. Uh, about the you know Rio Tinto's uh, safety performance to set some more context, um, it really is a story in two parts. I'm sure, like a lot of the other companies that are dialing in today, you share a similar safety story, where over the last decade or more, you have been you've achieved reduction in your um, all injury frequency rate or your trip rate or whatever metric you apply um, to a point where for Rio Tinto we, we have hit um, what may be deemed a, a plateau in our count of injuries or, or rate of injuries which is which is really a great challenge for us to, to break through. Um, but in parallel to that we really are yet to make the step change on fatalities to enable us to achieve our number one goal which is to achieve our first fatality for a year. In Rio Tinto's 145-year history, we're yet to achieve a calendar year fatality-free, and that is, you know, priority one. Uh, we we did through the 2000 and end of 2015 through 2016 achieve an 18-month uh, period where the company went fatality-free, um, but not within a calendar year. So that is that is the goal. Um, we have not yet uh, achieved it, and we're, we're um, I guess, resolute in our drive towards um, that goal. And, and CRM plays a critical part um, in that, supported by the, the safety standards and our other systems and, and leadership programs. Um, building upon that, uh, you know, safety performance and story in two parts, um, we have our safety strategy which is shown on the on the screen here. Um, I share this. I think it's a it's a good it's a good strategy that other businesses um, can can consider. Um, obviously, you know we we've learnt from others uh, in terms of defining our strategy. So I guess I want to share where we've landed. Um, we really build our strategy around this what we call the safety triangle, which actually has a third dimension to it, where we recognise the difference between injury reduction down in the bottom left hand corner versus fatality elimination in the top there and then catastrophic event or major hazards down in the right hand corner there which are the catastrophic uh, you know multiple fatality events that are uh, lower likelihood um, so we we treat all three dimensions of our safety strategy uh, with equal focus but different focus in recognition that, per the last slide, what enables us to drive down injuries doesn't always lead to prevention of fatalities, let alone catastrophic events. And we all know that also in the, um, you know, in the vehicles and driving space. Um, um, we, we do want to reduce the unsafe acts and the minor incidents, but ultimately we also want to prevent fatalities. And, and it's not always the same strategies that apply to to all three areas. Um, so that, that's our 
safety strategy, um, I guess, in, in, in summary for, for context. Jerome, I do have a couple of spots through the presentation where I'm happy to take questions if there's been any posed, but if not, I'll just um, keep moving on. I think you might as well just keep moving on. We haven't got any as yet, um, but I know there's yeah. got a lot more detail coming in, so I think we'll, if there are, we'll grab them the next session. Okay, great. So, and I'm happy to take any um, questions around Rio Tinto as an organisation, our safety performance or safety strategy, because I think that's quite an interesting um, um, conversation in itself. Um, so I'm going to move now into the Rio Tinto's um, critical risk management program, which really sits at the heart of the case study um, that was um, developed in partnership with uh, NRSPP. Um, I want to do that by first getting people to, I guess, reflect on this particular image. As I get into the next few slides, we naturally end up in a conversation around systems and processes and metrics and all those good things. But I think we do need to take a moment to reflect on, at the end of the day, our programs around um, real people in the field. And it's these guys um, that are the ones exposed to the risks that we're trying to manage. And we must you know, engage with them into the design of um, programs that they can engage with, that they value and then they feel makes a difference. So at the end of the day, I think that keeping that image is, um, is important. This is a photo of our um, Ayatolgoy project in Mongolia, which is a massive copper project with uh, close to 15,000 people working on that one um, project. And you can see there they're using some visual management as they're setting up their job um, before, before starting. I will come back to that piece. Um, so our, our CRM program really started with, we knew we needed to do something different in addition to what we'd already been working on in Rio Tinto, which is quite a, quite a systems heavy program um, built around um, bow ties and starting to identify critical controls. But we knew we needed to go further. We really needed to get down to, well, how are those guys in the last picture, um, how do they understand their risks? How do they understand their controls? How do they know if their controls are working? And what would they do if, if they weren't? So we, we ended up benchmarking with um, Escondida, which is a major copper mine in Chile, um, operated by BHP in joint venture with uh, Rio Tinto. Um, in our benchmarking with Escondida, um, we were quite impressed with what we experienced there, where when we went out to the front line and we asked those questions that I just described, there was a really consistent answer where whether it was the employees at the front line or contractors, they knew their risks, they knew their controls, they knew if the controls are working, their role, and what to do if they weren't. So we thought, well, there's something in the recipe at Escondida that we need to learn from and, um, and add to what we're already doing. Um, and so we took that away. Um, and we started a program across the whole of Rio Tinto, across all of our operations, standardised approach um, across all of the fatality risks in our business and across each of the layers of the organisation. And we ran that program, um, we, we finalised the design and it had an accelerated implementation of that program and I'm going to talk more about that um, design and implementation now. Um, as I said, we, we, we took what we felt worked from Escondida. I note the slide there says we, we, we adapted it. I guess in many ways we really adopted it. We tried to limit the amount of redesign um, on a system that we knew that would work. So I guess for us that was critical learning one, was if something works, focus on adopting rather than adapting. Um, and you know, I, I spent the prior 10 years, I think, trying to adapt to our context and when I probably should have been putting more energy into adopting. Uh, that, that's a key, key lesson there. Um, we did a rapid implementation. 
Um, we had a very strong approach to um, collaboration and sharing. Um, we didn't say one site was the benchmark in Rio. We we thought we saw there was good pockets of good practice across the group. So it was about us uh, implementing and learning together, and we felt that all sites played a role um, in that. So that was kind of the journey that we implemented. So this started in 2015, and um, I guess by the end of 2018, we're hoping to have sort of fully implemented um, CRM. That doesn't mean it's fully embedded and sustained. It just means, I guess, the program phase is um, drawing to a conclusion, and we hand over into a more embedding and sustaining phase of um, of our program. Um, you know, well, what is CRM? Um, in summary, it's a layered risk control verification process where we have four layers. Um, each layer is assigned, um, you know, I guess to a layer in the organization with a specific tool and a specific role. So you can see there, general managers ultimately own the risk managers and superintendents own and evaluate the controls, supervisors or crew leaders verify that the controls are in place on a shift by shift basis, and operators, maintainers, contractors verify the controls um, on a task by task basis. That's our, I guess, triangular or layered model uh, for CRM. It's a fairly simple system design and I think that's why it's resonated pretty well with our um, organisation. Like all new programs, you know, there's a, there's a change piece and there's things we do well and things we could have done better. But overall, we feel that this layered model that's fairly simple has resonated quite well um, throughout the layers of the organisation. One key thing that is is worth mentioning up front with our critical risk management program is we have used technology. Um, we've driven a standardized approach across the group where we have the same set of risks, we have the same set of controls, and we have the same set of questions to verify those controls across the whole organization. So if you're doing vehicles and driving in Africa, the set of risks or the set of controls and the set of questions you ask are the same as if you're doing it in the Pilbara in Western Australia. The controls and questions are the same. Yeah, you know, We do allow some minor adaption um, or additions if there's unique controls, let's say a, a, um, a, a technology that a particular site has but another one doesn't, we could add that in specific to that particular um, operation but generally speaking, we, we operate on a standardized um, platform. The technology has been a massive enabler for us in terms of driving a standardized approach across the, across the group. And the technology enables us to capture the data at each of those three layers that I just talked about. The general manager and the manager use the same tool through the technology, so we have three layers. Um, the technology enables us to have a standardised approach, control the approach, um, gather data, and obviously then do reporting and analytics um, on the data. Um, the technology is, is, um, we, is in partnership with Ford Safety, who are the consultancy, safety consultancy, who do technology piece, um, who were working with Escondida, so we also partnered with Ford Safety in our um, global program. Um, you know, when we started the journey around the use of technology and ultimately mobile application in the field, we had pockets of resistance, pockets of acceptance. So our, our, our initiative was obviously trying to drive for more mobility. We believe in it um, at, a, at a group level and we just need to enable it um, safely in the field. I'm sharing with you here an example of the mobility take up in one of our businesses or in one of our what we call product groups in, in Rio Tinto, um, which is like a commodity group. 
um, you can see the take up. So, so back in uh, July, we initiated um, mobility in the field uh, at the operator level, what we call the critical control checklist level, and we had almost no verifications done, which is the blue. As we move up within the space of six to 12 months, we're now doing, uh, in June we did 75,000 verifications using mobile uh, application in the field, um, just in that one commodity group, which is quite, um, quite, quite a lot. <laughs> um, we have a very relentless focus on doing control verification. So every time someone checks a control in the field, that's counted as a verification. So we did 75,000 verifications in that one product group in June. Um, we do about 120,000 uh, control verifications at the leader level across the group each month, which, um, which is you know a significant amount. And, and in the, at the lowest level in terms of the operator, it's only some pockets of the business that are building up in that space. So rapid take up in some parts of the group around mobility. The next uh, point I'm going to mention around our CRM program, and I'm going to pause again, see if there's any questions, is around um, the visual messaging and branding. We were quite big in the launch of our program and support the change management to have a really strong narrative and to have a really strong brand when it came to CRM. Um, that was just the, the, our yellow and black um, livery there. And we produced a lot of artifacts that supported um, the program implementation. In fact, probably the group didn't really build that many artifacts. What we did is we allowed the, you know, the sites and businesses to naturally build those, but just provide some brand guide, guidance. Okay, so, so, so the building of a lot of these artifacts that were used for to support the comms narrative change program um, were quite consistent. So when people see um, those checklists and the colors and the icons, they know it's CRM, which equals fatality elimination. So that was a really strong point. Um, we found that the combination of um, a standardized model with obviously very strong executive support, combined with technology, combined with a strong collaboration, combined with strong branding, um, worked very well in terms of our uh, program rollout. I will, Jerome, I'll pause there in case there's any questions that have come in. Well, we have a couple, thank you, uh, Anthony. So the first one I've got okay. here is from Matthew. Um, being a global company, how do you manage the diversity of culture and getting them to buy into risk management? Oh, well, that's a great question. I'll, I'll, one, two parts to that. I think the really clear narrative around um, CRM is around fatality prevention and it's about what can prevent you or your mates getting killed. What can we do to support you in staying safe? Um, I think it's a really strong narrative that anyone could buy into, um, no matter whether they're in a very dependent culture or they're in a very mature, you know, interdependent culture. So we stuck to the one quite strong narrative and we believe that that overcome, overcame a lot of cultural um, perspectives. We armed our leaders with that same clear narrative so we had very consistent messaging and we, we kept a very tight scope around CRM. If you see the yellow and black, it's fatality elimination which is, in, which is about you know, protecting you and your mates. So, I think that's, I hope that kind of answers part one of that question. Um, part two was around kind of the standardization across our group. Um, naturally, every business said we're different. Uh, we've got different controls. We've got different risks. We've got different questions we'd want to ask. 
the more we got into it, the more we realised that we're more alike than we think. Um, so yes, there's some natural differences in the peripheral, but generally speaking, you know, controlling vehicles and driving, and what are the critical controls around vehicles and driving in Africa are the same as in the Pilbara. Um, same with working at height. So one of the things that we did is we went, we, we'd go to the intent. Does everyone agree that this particular control um, in its intent is right? It's a critical control. Forget about what we call it for a minute, but in its intent, do we agree? Um, and then talk about the questions. What were the, what were the things that you'd want to ask about that control? And again, go to the intent. For you know, so um, is the barrier 360 degrees around the load to prevent people from entering into the area? Is the intent of that question a good question? And if you could get people to agree on that, then the actual final wording of the question was less important. It was about the intent. So I think the strong narrative and driving to the intent is is sort of how we aligned across the group, not without its challenges. Great answer. Very, I know. Complicated question, yeah. that one. Yeah, very much so. Um, so we've got another question take here. One more and then I'll, yeah, take one more and then I'll, I'll keep moving on. Certainly. Um, and we have got a couple other question spots coming up, everyone. And we have had a couple of questions right. asking to be touched on soon in the presentation. So I'll go into this one. I don't have their name. How does human factors fit within the CRM program and feeding back issues of redesign of equipment process interfaces, etc.? cetera? Oh, look, that again is a fantastic question and I'll answer it in two parts again. I think, did you say human factors or human That's performance? Right. Human factors. Human factors. I want to answer it in terms of two parts. So one in terms of human performance, which is around, you know, people, even the best operators make mistakes, right? So one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that the the CRM approach, which is around here are the critical controls, here are the controls that you need to be very cognizant of before you operate the equipment or while you're operating the equipment. Um, and we position, and here's the questions you would ask to check those controls. We tried to, well, we did our best to try to position it that CRM is an error reduction tool, for want of a better word. I guess you'll never prevent error, but you can reduce error. Um, so we wanted to position it as an error prevention tool, so or, sorry, reduction tool, so that people would buy into the program more because it, it's a it's it's acknowledging people make mistakes and we wanted to position um, CRM in that context. We then because of we have the standardized content, we've been able to look for trends in the data. So if we're finding a particular control is, uh, has a high non-compliance rate, we can dig into that control um, and, and look for, for better ways of designing that control or potentially even replacing that control. Uh, when we do verifications, we also capture, if it's a non-compliance, we capture comments or what did you observe or did or didn't do um, and you can also, through the mobile app, you can add photographs. So we can add evidence. So I guess, you know, Jerome, in that point, we can really mine into the information to get a better understanding around control effectiveness and look to redesign um, controls. To be honest, I think in Rio Tinto, if I think about the journey we're on, we, we, we've been through the phase of identifying our issues we're now in the phase of what I would call fixing the controls we have, but we're yet to really move into the phase of, you know, getting better controls, uh, replacing replacing admin controls with more engineering controls. We're still on that on that journey. So that's I think hopefully I've given a reasonable answer there. <laughs> I think you have. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep moving on. So. Um, Moving to, I guess, the third part of the presentation, which is around um, 
you know, the, the core of the case study, which is around what was coined the, the safety loop that we've, we've applied. You know, we say here it's got four parts. Oops. We've got the bow ties. We, we, in Rio, we've used bow ties officially since around 2007, even though we started before that. But it's really been more recently that we've been able to really start to use the bow ties to full effect um, through better identification of critical controls and starting to operationalize them. So we use bow ties. We, we use them then to identify what are the critical controls. We, we look at um, non-compliance information around our critical controls and we look at incidents to understand our control effectiveness and then we look at um, um, learnings um, from that and then that ties back to the um, to the bow ties to create that um, uh, safety loop you know we still I think in in Rio Tinto are not fully connected in terms of that safety loop we've got the four parts um, working but not they're not totally lubricated we're still working uh, working through that um, so, you know, just exploring a couple of those areas a little more. Um, we use a fairly traditional um, bow tie uh, approach in Rio Tinto. I guess at this point I'd like to uh, acknowledge the work by Maureen Hassel from the University of Queensland and um, her personnel for the support that they've given us in Rio Tinto around the work on bow ties. And, and the work that we've done, particularly in our iron ore business, to understand our um, risk and controls in the vehicles and driving space. So that's been um, high quality work because we know that bow ties, if done well, can add an awful lot of value. Bow ties not done well at times can, can, can just create noise or, or give a false sense of representation of what the risk um, um, looks like. But the bow tie method think has been, um, uh, it, it's a very good method to identify primarily what are your critical controls and understanding what are, how many of those controls you have on each of your um, causal pathways. Um, moving, moving down, for us we, we did establish a um, definition of well, what are the critical controls, which is obviously step two in the, in the loop. Um, which by definition we've said are an object or device, a technical system or a direct human action that of itself um, directly um, reduces the energy or mitigates its outcome. So that, that last bit is really important that it of itself uh, has an effect. Um, that definition is aligned with the um, ICMM the International Council of Mines and Metals definition of uh, what is a critical control and we, we've adopted that into um, Rio Tinto. Prior to that our bow ties were very large and they had a lot of information on them so we used that definition to uh, rationalise our bow ties down to get to the critical, um, critical few. Um, that's quite a uh, revealing process in itself. Um, a lot of our operators were quite reluctant to let go of um, a lot of controls that they believe were um, uh, critical controls but kind of weren't. Um, in many times they were what we were calling, I guess, supporting processes. So one of the exercises we did here is we took one of our original bow ties that had the I don't know, you know, you're talking, by the time you add it all up, you've got 100 controls or so on a page and said, okay, let's go th through this bow tie and understand which controls of themselves um, mitigate the energy. What other things or controls on this bow tie are actually supporting processes? So training in the control, auditing in the control, inspection of the control, maintenance of the control, they're all supporting processes of the control. They're not the control of themselves. So we went through that uh, process and we, we, we got it down to the controls that we have uh, on, the, on, the, 
on the screen here for the two vehicle risks that sit within um, CRM. Look, you know, there will be people on the call that will say, oh, some of those, a couple of those uh, controls there, you know, could be tightened up a little bit and them of themselves may not meet the definition that I've described. And, you know, we recognise that. Um, I guess there's two points there. We want to make sure that the controls we've listed make sense uh, to the frontline audience. So something like a, uh, a vehicle pre-operational inspection is what they would call it and it makes sense to them and if we emphasise that as a critical control, they get that. What's actually really important is the detail that sits below that. What are the specific things that you are checking in a pre-operational check that are critical? It's your braking system, it's your steering system, for example. Uh, there are other things that could get checked, but we would not say that they are the, you know, super critical items. So we really want to do the work to get down to what are the critical few. Um, even if it's not puristically perfect, we want to get controls that are well understood by the front line and they can see them as critical controls. So that, that's the work that we did um, uh, there. The next piece of work was around mapping out our incident um, data to understand um, where our vehicles and driving incidents are coming from. So, you know, to give some flavour to that, across the, you know, one of our large commodity groups, for example, um, well, let's say across the group, I think we had 54 um, what we call potential fatal incidents over 2016, 2017 period relating to vehicles and driving. So these are actual events that under a different circumstance uh, could have led to a fatality. So that may be a vehicle rollover, that may be a haul truck contacting a light vehicle, um, that may be a micro sleep where someone's hit a berm and, and not gone over an edge. So we, we have, you know, a lot of those incidents in Rio Tinto and we map them back to our, um, our, our causal, you know, pathways here and you can kind of see the spread of um, um, how incidents relate to those pathways. And then, you know, yes, we have done the work to dig into, well, which controls or critical controls failed um, on those pathways. Naturally, the, um, the human element, and particularly fatigue, is a critical issue in the, in the group and one of um, particular uh, focus. So fatigue, fatigue detection um, controls, um, journey management, Plans when you talk when I mentioned before about the you know literally million kilometres that we're driving um, per annum just in one commodity group sorry per week you can imagine the amount of fatigue that can creep in so that is a critical focus area uh, for, for for Rio Tinto um, we also found that you know not surprising to some of the vehicles and driving experts on the um, on the on the call that when called to action, the mitigation controls are often the most effective. Seat belts, um, NCAR ra uh, rated vehicles, um, roller, whatever other types of protection um, we have in place are often very effective controls. Um, so designing that resilience into um, our vehicles um, to cater for in some cases, um, the fail-safe, I guess, scenarios is, is quite critical, I guess, in the, in, in the strategy. Um, just on a, on a related point to that, um, I've talked about the controls earlier and I listed, I guess, the fairly rudimentary controls. Rio Tinto is doing a lot of work in the, you know, what are the better controls space. We're a member of the Immersed which is the Earth Moving Equipment Safety Roundtable um, with our peer companies, predominantly ICMM member companies, to work with the uh, original equipment manufacturers to ensure that we're designing in um, uh, inherently safer controls. We're also doing the work within our organisation 
to better design our pit to avoid um, you know accident incident scenarios. Um, we're also doing the work on fatigue that I mentioned before, etc. So we we apply this uh, nine level um, framework that was developed by Immersed to shape our thinking around um, vehicles and driving controls. I think that's quite a good framework to um, share. I might I might keep going, Jerome, and then we'll take questions at the end because I've just got two slides to go. So. Um, I guess I was asked to, yeah, I was asked to reflect on um, the results impact that we're having around our CRM program, um, and then share some of our program tips. So um, I say up the front there, as I said earlier, we're yet to achieve our goal of fatality free, a uh, fatality free calendar year. Um, we had a reasonable stretch in Rio Tinto, but you know, yet again, we were struck by a, a fatality um, was related to a drill drill rod incident in the Pilbara, and then unfortunately in 2017 we had two two more fatalities. Um, one related to a process safety orientated scenario, and one related to a heat stress um, scenario. Um, but our CRM program has you know, strengthened significantly our understanding of risk and controls at the front line and getting it down to, like I said, those critical few controls that we want our operators to understand and confirm their effectiveness or confirm that they're in place um, every time they do the fatality job or if, um, if a job changes. Um, we have had a lot of targeted um, actions to address gaps, um, we raise our actions more at the out of what we see at uh, directly at the manager superintendent level, and um, you know we we've done something like 50,000 actions across our program globally um, each year. About 75% of which are actually what we call fixed in the field. So when someone sees at the manager or superintendent level when they visit a job site and see something is not right, or they pull out a document and realise there's an inconsistency, they fix it on the spot. Um, so 75% of our actions are addressed um, in the moment. Um, clearer role accountabilities, um, trying it's helping building a supporting culture around um, critical controls. Um, I guess the two key phrases that we use around um, supporting culture is the, I guess the, as Andrew Hopkins saying of uh, challenge the green, embrace the red. So we, we have a drive towards um, red is good. Um, if you do something about it, you're discovering something new. It's a free lesson. Embrace the red um, and work on it. So that's so that's sort of the culture we try, we, we're trying to build. The other one is around the what we call stop and seek help, which again is a human performance, human factors term, which means if something's not right, stop and seek help. And the critical controls being in place, um, if they're not in place, that's what we would call stop criteria. Um, okay, we, we're driving for standardisation. It's probably the first operational safety program that the group, where the group has driven um, complete standardisation apart from the safety standards themselves. Often we would have um, different programs across the group, but we've really used CRM to drive standardisation. Uh, we're gaining a lot of insights out of our, our, our data. Um, we've had quite quick mobilisation of learnings. Um, so if we find a gap in a control, um, we can insert um, a question or change the content and send it out globally. We can show we can do reports on how often those questions are being asked, etc. Um, probably that last one, second last one there, and I'll, I'll stop, is around um, purposeful leader engagement in the field. We've given content to leaders to ensure that when they go into the field, they're asking quite targeted and quite purposeful questions and consistent questions. So it doesn't become a hobby horse type conversation for a leader in the field. 
um, we're getting consistent questions across our, our group, which the frontline operators um, like and they feel more respected when they're getting uh, more consistent questions from, from, from leaders. Um, last slide, this was in the back of the um, um, case study around some tips for other companies entering into this space. Um, I guess, you know, why don't I start with the, the three areas that I think we could have done better. Um, we could have spent more time um, establishing the context around CRM, um, which I talked about, you know, getting that narrative across the group and making sure that our frontline believe in the narrative. We could have spent even more time doing that, um, but this was a trade-off between, you know, a, a, an accelerated deployment and how we build that up. So we're trying to build that up constantly. That's the first one. Second one is. We probably could have done even more around integration, making sure CRM wasn't a bolt-on to what we're already doing. Um, it was integrated. And um, I've just forgotten the third one I was going to say. It'll come back to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the... Um, um, oh, yep, I've lost it. The, but you can see the points there, the seven tips I had. Um, adopt, you know, adopt where you can. You know, you can spend a lot of time creating new programs when there's good programs out there. Try to reduce the complexity, meaning that's about inter integrate, don't add on. Um, make it easier and, and make sure the questions are relevant to the operators. operators. Faster rollout equals faster learning. We didn't have a playbook for CRM, so we kind of just got into it, and we're glad we did. Try to drive for um, um, mindsets over metrics. We were quite metric driven at the start. Um, and we now are trying to balance that. And make sure you've got good belief in your program um, as you go forward. I'm going to quickly jump now to, I guess, any other questions, Jerome? I hope that's been a been a, um, a good run through of our, our program and how it applies into um, vehicles and driving in Rio Tinto as our number one fatality risk. Mate, no, it's always great getting insights and we have quite a large number of questions that I've got here to throw at you now, so I hope you're ready. So the first yeah. one I'm gonna to throw at you um, is why have you changed, it's from uh, Cobos, why have you changed from focusing on the near miss minor injury prevention that will prevent the serious injuries and more, more so to the fatalities? Well, I'd say the two, two things there would be, um, we haven't changed, we, 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 we keep a balanced strategy. So I said at the start, we, we talk about injury reduction, fatality elimination and catastrophic event prevention. We make sure we've got programs in all three of those areas um, with an equal focus. I guess we just recognise that you know what creates injuries doesn't always lead for, to fatalities. So, for example, a, a small um, um, unstable ground unstable ground um, underground may lead to a slip trip fall, but it's not going to lead to a fatality. Um, the mechanism for a rock fall underground relating to a fatality is quite different. So, so we just recognise that um, it's different. If you think of the old birds or Heinrich's Triangle. Um, I think in, in some ways a lot of people would say it's been a little debunked, um, that what leads to fatalities is probably a, a, a skinnier slither up the centre of the triangle. Not every unsafe act has the potential to lead to a fatality. Great. A question here from Tim. How does CRM intersect with HSEC slash sustainability systems, ERM and compliance, and specifically metals processing? Well, that's a that's a big big question. I'm going to I'd say it like this. A lot of our I'll try to simplify my answer there, which is in in Rio Tinto we used to we'd always apply a, a process of um, a bit like the Plan Do Check Act. We would say for a given task or even design, we would say we're going to have a planning phase, we're going to have a job setup phase, and then we would have a job sort of execution phase. And we have tools 
for each of those phases. For example, in the planning phase, take five, job hazard analysis, risk assessments, they're all in what I would call the planning phase. And with the introduction of CRM, in some ways we've added an extra step into the job, which is plan, set up, verify, execute. So we've added an extra step into our system um, that's very explicitly around verifying the controls, are they working? So when it comes to our management system, I guess we're positioning CRM um, really, it's really strong in that verification step. It's dependent on good risk identification and good hazard identification, but it's very much around the verification step. And then, and then it also adds a lot of data um, um, to your system, you know, so that you can link in, you can combine the CRM data with incident data and other data to get a, get a more holistic insight into how the controls are operating. So I guess that's kind of how it sits in the system. Okay, thank you. Um, question here from Stephen. What are the rates of on-site and off-site events or deaths? Oh, gee, I, I probably would have to <laughs> um, go to the data, get data on that one, but um, the bulk, the bulk of the incidents that we've had are um, what we call in pit incidents related to vehicles and trucks. Um, we have had off-site events. We found that in a number of cases. Um, the off-site events in the, in the locations that we operate, such as in Western Australia, uh, we end up with um, vehicle rollovers and we have, due to you know, safety specifications on vehicles and so forth, actual um, potential fatality rate, so to speak, is possibly lower than what it is in terms of um, on-site scenarios. That would be my gut reaction to that. Jerome or Stephen, um, so the bulk of the incidents on site, but that off site long kilometre journey risk scenario is still still quite present. Present, and I think the the point around journey planning, fatigue management, combined with um, safety specifications on vehicles are three of our key controls there. Okay. Um and I think this is a good segue on from that one, one here from Nigel. How do driverless vehicles change what you do? Oh, gee, that's a, that's a very, very good question too. As people know, Rio Tinto is quite, um, has quite a lot of work into the driverless um, vehicle space. Um, the bulk of the work in Rio Tinto is currently in, well, almost all of the work is in uh, um, trucks, and mining equipment and drills. Um, and we've set up um, autonomous, I guess you call it, uh, pits. Um, and that's been a real forefront in, in that space. Um, and obviously, you know, a key benefit of that is about removing, uh, m removing that risk, right? Um, we, we obviously, you, you retain the risk related to manned vehicles going into um, unmanned vehicle pits. Um, which is something we have a lot of control um, over. Uh, Rio Tinto, I guess, is not yet in the space of um, uh, driverless vehicles outside of the uh, pit in, in environment. I'd uh, be happy to follow up with someone specifically on that, if needed, to put you in touch with the um, best person in the group to talk on that topic. Right, thanks, Anthony. Um, question here from um, Harry, who sort of, I guess, draws on from what I uh, asked a little bit earlier in, the, in a, the presentation. Given the diversity of work sites in Africa and WA in terms of heritage and culture, how is it, is it to have the same controls in both sites? Uh, look, I, I, kind of as I alluded to um, earlier, if I go back to the level of control that we're, we're talking about here, I must say, in either of those contexts, if you want to separate, if you want to prevent vehicles striking people, is segregation a good control? Um, is demarcation a good control? Is positive communication a good control? So back to that point, I, I, we really go to the in, intent of those controls 
and we would say they stand the ground um, in either context. And even the detail that sits below those controls still stand the ground in either context. Uh, like I said, you know, a particular site might have a in-vehicle monitoring system that they would want to add to that, and we would we would call that we call that a local control. Uh, that might apply to just that site or just that business, and they add that into their context. But generally speaking, um, we've had pretty good take up, or very good take up in terms of different contexts, um, accepting the different um, uh, their sort of standard suite of controls. Right. Question here from David. What has Rio done or is proposing to ensure that mine roads and traffic management reflect industry best practice for road design and siting at the planning level and on site during operations? So this is about ensuring traffic engineering principles are incorporated into design and operation. Yeah, that's a good question. It comes back to that um, hierarchy of, um, of of controls, for want of a better a better term. There, we we recognise that we have uh, a number of legacy issues in our pits. Um, and that at times, you know, the uh, the standard around um, road design and demarcation and so forth is obviously different to um, outside of that environment. Um, there's a lot of work going into the Rio Tinto um, road design um, guidelines to lift the standard in specifically the area that's been um, um, raised. And that, and that feeds into new pit design. As you know, mining is a fairly dynamic process at times, so it can feed into that pit design. And then we're also looking for opportunities to, to um, retrospectively um, build in better, better controls. But it is always quite interesting, as I'm sure some of the experts on the call will know, is when you do um, audits of mine roads and pits against uh, um, ex, um, um, guidelines, you know, you can we can pick up some really simple things um, to improve. Whether it's uh, spacing of indicators to ensure we, you know, can clearly see the curvature in the road. Whether it's the design of intersections to make them inherently safer, um, etc. So, you know, I'll, I think a lot of work in that space, but um, more work um, to be done. I think we're coming towards the end, so I'll just ask the last couple of questions. Uh, I think this one should be a quick one uh, from Merv. What do you mean by stable parking? Uh, so fun fundamentally stable parking. So so for us, that's effectively, um, you know, if, if the stability controls, hand brakes, um, other brakes, mechanical brakes, et cetera, were to fail, would the vehicle still stay in the same space. So obviously shocking of vehicles, using spoon drains or other techniques like that, um, 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 boom down on the ground for a, um, a front end loader, other mechanical uh, means of preventing rollaways, which uh, is an over-verified control in Rio Tinto because it's an easy one to check. But unfortunately, we're, we're constantly reminded of the importance of that control because of the number of incidents that have happened in the mining industry related to rollaway um, equipment. And I think looking at time, this will be our last one uh, from Tim. How do metric, sorry, what metrics do you use to demonstrate the impact of CRM? And so how do you demonstrate that you are managing the high severity risk better than before influencing CRM? Yeah, well, that's a that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you left that one to last, Jerome. <laughs> the, the, yeah. So obviously, uh, the ultimate test is fatality rates. Um, so we 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 we, um, but even as you know, even if we were to go to a year or two years without a fatality, we can't claim that as a victory, right? We have to maintain that that chronic unease. Secondly, is around our um, potential fatal incident rate but also type of incidents that we're seeing. Um, I think the next one is around, are we reducing what we would call repeat reds, repeat non-conformances? If we're seeing the same pattern of non-conformance on the same controls, we're clearly not making a difference. 
Um, I, I, there's a couple more like that, but I would also go to what I think is really important is about the front lines understanding of um, what can kill them, what can what keeps them safe, how do they know the controls are working, what to do uh, if they're not. I think that that piece is really important, and I know that's subjective but I think that's kind of the ultimate test. If the guys value it in that context, um, we're on a winner, and I think that's the um, um, the goal that we're, we're striving towards. Fantastic. I guess it's it's getting that buy-in of our hearts and minds. So, yeah, thank you very much. I do apologise to those who didn't answer um, ask all the questions that we had, but I'll pass them on to Anthony. And, and would you mind answering them separately, Anthony? Oh, of course. I'd be, I'd be delighted to, Jerome. All good. <laughs> thank you very much for that, mate. Um, thank special you. thank you to Anthony for giving us his time today, and thank you very much to our audience for joining us and giving us so many deep, uh, penetrating questions. So thank you all to everyone. If you wish to subscribe to the Energy Penny newsletter, that'll be keeping you informed as to upcoming webinars. We have great ones coming up um, next month as well. And thank you again to Anthony and Rio Tinto for supporting and developing this case-studying webinar.